Once again, I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ, hoping that the Lord has kept you fine in his word. And now we are ready to begin the class. We are still doing the New Testament survey and we want to proceed from where we had left before. And these are non-Pauline, these are Pauline episodes, Pauline episodes. And let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, we bless you. Give us wonderful moment in your presence. Even bless this class, oh God, every student. May your word take part in our lives to inspire us and to encourage us in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you so much, students, even as you follow up on these classes. And right now we are going to do the New Testament survey right from the book of First Timothy. First Timothy. First Timothy. And uh, I want us to have a look at the author of this book. The author of this book. And this is Apostle Paul who wrote this letter to Timothy. And that word you will see in the book of First Timothy chapter 1 and verses 1 and another thing which is very key here is that uh, the date and setting for this book is AD 62 AD 62 to AD 66 AD 62 to AD 66 and I want us to see the Purpose for Paul writing this letter. Why was Paul writing to Timothy? And number one is to encourage him in his responsibility. Encourage him in his responsibility. To encourage, Paul was writing to encourage Timothy in his responsibility. And what was the responsibility that Timothy was having, it was to oversee the work of the Ephesian church. To oversee the work of the Ephesian church. Timothy was given the responsibility to oversee the church in Ephesus and possibly the other churches in the province of Asia. He was given the responsibility to oversee the church of Ephesus as well as the churches within Asia. And we can see that uh, in First Timothy chapter 3 verse 1, First Timothy chapter 1 verse 3, chapter 1 verse 3, the letter lays the foundation for ordaining elders. This letter is laying foundation for ordaining elders in the church as it can be seen in ordaining elders order for ordaining elders in the church ordaining elders in the church and that one is evident in chapter 3 and verses 1 to 7 1 to 7 we can see how Paul was instructing Timothy how elders can be ordained in church and also to provide guidance for ordination. It provides guidance. Guidance for ordination. For ordination. Guidance for ordination. Paul was instructing Timothy and giving him the mandate and the responsibility was having to oversee the Ephesian church plus all the churches which were in Asia, as we have seen to encourage him and also to ordain elders, guidelines how to ordain elders and guidance for ordination itself, how it should be conducted. And uh, this letter is also known as a uh, pastoral episode whereby it shows and gives the manual of uh, a pastor or elders in church. 
and how the people in offices can be ordained. In essence, First Timothy is a leadership manual. It's a leadership manual. Leadership manual. First Timothy is a leadership manual which gives instructions and organizational and administration guidance. It's more of administration, 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 and also organizational setup. So that is first. Timothy, I want us to look, okay, uh, let me give you this verse, First Timothy 3, 8 to 13. 3, 8 to 13, you will see that one. But I want us to look at the key verses, the key verses in this letter of Paul to Timothy. You will see in Timothy chapter 2, well, these are key verses. Key verses, and you will see chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 5. What does chapter 2, verse 5 say? For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man is Christ. One God, one mediator, and the mediator is Jesus Christ. We also have 1 Timothy 2, 12, 2, verse 12. Also, that says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. Well, that's how it was coming out. And also we can see chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. I said before, New Testament survey, this is certificate level whereby we are just doing the summary or the overview of the whole book. But when we get to diploma and degree level, we shall be digging deep to understand why was Paul telling Timothy that women should keep silent and they should not talk in church, etc., and all these kind of things. And we can see three, verse one to three, the Bible says that here is a trust what he's saying. If anyone sets his heart of being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, it gives the quality. We will come to dig deeper as to why he was saying that. He should be having one wife, temperament, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, nor violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. But many times we see this is uh, contrary because uh, a lot of preachers are turning to be lovers of money. A lot of preachers are turning to be lovers of money and a lot of preachers are turning to love <laughs> So I'm saying that a lot of people are turning to be lovers of money, having many wives, as opposed to what the scripture says. And we can see also another key verse here is 1 Timothy 4, 9, chapter 4 and verses 9 up to 10. And what does it say? Paul is saying here that uh, this is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance and for this we labor and strive that we have put our hope in the living God who is the savior of all men and especially of those who believe. These are the words of Paul to Timothy and again we can see another key verse is chapter 6 verse 12. Chapter 6 and verses 12 and the Bible is very clear. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. This is another key verse altogether. 
And Paul was instructing Timothy that you may fight a good fight. Don't let it go. The faith you have received, it's worth fighting for, it's worth living for, and it's something of uh, substance, something you can hold on to. It's not just by the way thing you can live it or you can do whatever you want with it, but fight is a good fighter and fight a good fight all together. And we want to go to brief summary about this book of First Timothy. This is the first letter Paul wrote to Timothy, a young pastor who had been of great help to Paul in his ministry. Uh, there are a lot of young pastors who are coming up today. And uh, what should we do with them? Let us encourage them just like Paul did to Timothy. Timothy was a Greek. He was a Gentile, so to say. Greeks were Gentiles and Timothy was a Greek. And uh, we had seen before that Paul was called to reach to the Gentiles and Timothy is one of these Greek people. His mother was a Jewess and his father was a Greek. So in short, he was a Greek because the mother was a Jew and the father was Greek. And Paul was more than just a mentor and leader to Timothy. He was like a father to him, and Timothy was like a son to Paul. That one is very clear, as you can see in chapter 1, verse 2. Chapter 1 and verses 2, you will see Paul was more of a father to Timothy, and Timothy was more of a son to him, and uh, he really loved him. He nurtured him, he mentored him, and Timothy became a pastor, he was still a young pastor, and Paul begins the letter by urging Timothy to be on guard for false teachings, be on guard for false teachings, be on guard for false teachings. This is summary, summary of the, that letter, be on guard over false teachings, be on guard lest you be swayed away by heresies and all manner of evil that may lead you astray as a young pastor. Be uh, very vigilant against the false teachers, those who teach false doctrines. However, much of the letter deals with pastoral conduct, pastoral conduct, and we say that it's a more of administration and it's a pastor's manual or leadership manual altogether. And we can see in chapter 3, most of the letters deals with pastoral conduct, warnings about false teachings, and the church responsibility towards single members. Well, this one is very key here. Single members. We have single members in the church. A woman that uh, maybe is a widow, and we can see it is well articulated that uh, we have widows, elders, slaves in church, and all they come under one umbrella, the church. And we say that the church is the uh, body of uh, people who are called out from the world. They have gotten saved, and now all these widows are here, the elderly people are here, and the single people are here. It shows how they should conduct themselves, how they shall live a, a godly Christian life all throughout the letter. Paul encourages Timothy to stand firm and to persevere and to remain true to his calling. No matter what may come, Timothy, stand in your calling. As a young preacher or as a preacher, you've gone through a lot and still a lot are coming your way. Just be strong to your calling. When challenges come, keep praying, keep forging ahead, and just be vigilant and just to uh, teach the people how to live a godly Christian lives. That is the brief summary of this book. And maybe we may talk about practical application as we finish up that book of First Timothy. 
This is practical application. Practical application. Practical application. Practical application. Yeah, here we are. And we can see that uh, Jesus Christ is presented by Paul as the mediator between God and man. Jesus Christ is presented by Paul as mediator between God and man. And that one we had seen in uh, chapter 2, verse 5, right? It's here. Uh, Jesus being the mediator and the savior to all who believe in him. We had also seen about confession and also believing your faith in God. He is Lord of the church and Timothy serves him by pastoring his church. We said that Timothy was pastoring the church in Ephesus and at the same time he was the overseer over the churches all through Asia and he was pastoring. Thus, we find the main application of Paul's letter to his son in the faith. Paul instructs Timothy on matters of church doctrine. Be very careful with the church doctrine. Man of God, woman of God, you might not be a pastor. You are a Christian. Be very careful with the church doctrines. Any church you step in, make sure they teach the right doctrines. If not so, then find another church whereby you can learn the biblical teaching and doctrine so that you are not misled and be led astray. And we can use those same instructions in governing our local assemblies today. Likewise, the work and ministry of the pastor, the qualifications for an elder and the qualifications of a deacon are just as important and uh, pertinent today as they were in the church. This is very key. You as a pastor, give sound doctrine, teach the doctrine of the Bible so that you may not, after serving God, after persevering yourself, you lose your soul to eternal damnation, but that you may also enjoy the benefits and the score here with Christ in the heavenly blessings and his kingdom. And we can see Paul's, for those not called into leadership roles in the church, the book is still practical. Every follower must contend for the faith and avoid false doctrine. Every follower must stand firm and persevere. You are not a pastor, you are not a leader in church, but you also apply this, you contend for your faith. What is to contend for your faith? Keep praying, keep reading the Bible, keep going to church, keep good morals as a Christian, keep the instructions that is being taught in church, then you are good to go. And avoid false teachings, doctrines, as I've said before, these were the words of Paul to Timothy. And now we want to move on very fast and look at uh, the second Timothy. We want to look at the second Timothy. And uh, We want to look at 2 Timothy, but I think I had already said that uh, usually when Paul writes a letter, the second part of the letter is just to emphasize mainly on the first letter, to emphasize on some issues that may be prevailing in the church or in that particular group of people and now we can look at second timothy and we can see automatically paul is the author because he's the one that wrote the first letter and again he was writing this second letter 
and uh, again it was written uh, in the A year AD 67. AD 67, don't forget that one if you are to follow it keenly. AD 67, shortly before the Apostle Paul was put to death. Shortly before Apostle Paul was put to death. He was being persecuted, he was being mistreated, mishandled. Why? Because he was teaching and preaching about Jesus Christ. And we have seen that there were Judaizers or Jewish Gnosticisms and the Greek Stoic people who were scholars, learned, and they never wanted anything to do with Paul because Paul was preaching Christ. And we want to look at the purposes as to why Paul was writing this letter. Purposes as to why Paul was writing this letter. By this time, remember that he was in prison and he was imprisoned in Rome. But right in prison, he was still able to write letters to encourage others. This shows how strong he was in Christ by God's grace that right in prison, he was still encouraging others. And we can see that uh, he felt lonely and abandoned. At some time, he felt lonely and abandoned, and uh, he was just there. He recognized that uh, his earthly life was likely coming to an end. He was sorrowing. He was human, of course, and he could feel loneliness. He could feel his sufferings, and he was feeling like time has come that his life is going to end here on earth. His instincts were right and trying to show him that, hey, your days are numbered. And we can see that the book of Second Timothy is essentially Paul's last words. These are Paul's last words. And Paul looked past his own circumstance to express concern for the churches and specifically to Timothy. Paul wanted to use his last words to encourage Timothy and all other believers. So let's see these purposes. And uh, he was imprisoned in Rome. He was imprisoned in Rome. And something else to note, these were his last words. He was lonely. He was lonely, lonely and abandoned. He was lonely and he was also abandoned and he realized that uh, his last days, last days on earth, on earth it was his last days on earth and we can see that he was still concerned and uh, this letter of second timothy is his last words paul's last words last words and again we can see he was uh, instructing and encouraging other believers even to persevere in faith. That is 2 Timothy 3.14. 3.14. He was still encouraging them to persevere in faith and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ also in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. He was encouraging them Yet he knew that he was going to die. He was lonely, abandoned his last days on earth, and Paul was speaking his last words. And we can look at the key verses in this second Timothy. Key verses. These are some of the key verses.
the key verses uh, you can see is uh, 1 verse 7 whereby Paul is saying for God did not give us a spirit of timidity but a spirit of power of love and of self discipline so he was not being intimidated he was still very strong so he's saying God did not give us the spirit of timid but the spirit of love, the spirit of power, the spirit of self-discipline. And again in chapter 3 and verses 16 to 17, that same book, you can see that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. This one is a verse we are all well conversant with, that uh, they are good and profitable for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped to every good work. He's saying about equipping us, correcting us, rebuking us, every believer for every good work. And another key verse we can see is 4 verse, chapter 4, and verses 7 to 8, whereby he is saying, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Wow, this one is so, uh, so great. This one is very key. And uh, it just brings us back here that he was feeling lonely. He was uh, in his last days and uh, his last words. He's saying, I have finished the, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day and not only to me but also to all who have loved, longed for his appearance. Paul is speaking his last words here and he's just affirming that it's not only him the crown of glory is waiting that reward or is waiting not only for Paul also for you and for me that we believe in Jesus Christ as we can see and again he's saying I have fought a good fight I have finished the race we are still in the race we are still alive and therefore let us emulate this example of Paul and keep on with the gospel of Jesus Christ all those who are longing for his appearance like you and me let us keep on and on and on. Now I want to give the brief summary of this book. Brief summary of this book. Brief summary of this book. I had said before that uh, in certificate level, we are just going through the overview or the summary. When we come to diploma and to degree level, we will dig deep word by word, exegizing and trying to find the deeper meaning of every word that was spoken. And we can see that Paul encourages Timothy to remain passionate. He was encouraging to remain passionate. He was encouraging Timothy to remain passionate, firm, It was like he was saying, Timothy, I've been with you, I've walked with you, I've encouraged you, we pray together, I'm about to die, but anyway, keep on preaching the gospel, just be passionate about this gospel, you know my faith, keep on being firm in faith and in sound doctrine, also to keep the doctrine, keep the doctrine, to keep the doctrine as you will see in chapter 1 verse 1 to 2 1 verse 1 to 2 and also verse 13 you can as well see and now he say times there will be both intense persecution is trying to show him that uh, life may not be easy for him in the course of going being that Paul is not going to be there, persecution may arise 
and apostasy from the Christian faith as well. But Paul closes his writing with an intense plea for believers to stand firm in the faith and to the finish and to finish the race strong. Don't lose hope when persecution will come, but stand firm. Even though I won't be there to write you letters anymore, even though I won't be there to instruct you, but now with all this I've spoken to you, keep on with the doctrine, be passionate with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and just carry on. And that was, those were some of the last words of Paul. And now we want to look at the practical application as we wind up on this book of 2 Timothy. Practical application. Practical application. Practical application. How can we apply this in our lives? It's easy to get sidetracked in the Christian life. This is very true. You can attest to this that uh, it's very easy to get distracted from time and again. Challenges will come your way. But in as much as challenges will come and it's very easy to get distracted, we have to keep our eyes on the prize. Our eyes on the prize. That one is very key. Our eyes on the prize. Eyes on the prize. What is the prize for one who keeps faith? The Bible says that the persecution of this present age can never, ever be compared to the glory which shall be revealed when Jesus shall return. Our reward is great in heaven. One is that we shall live with him forever, but two is that we shall be given an imperishable reward for overcoming the temptations, the trials, and the persecutions in this present age. We shall reward, uh, be rewarded with great rewards in heaven. So we should be focusing on to the prize which we shall attain when Christ shall return. And also he is trying to say, uh, we have to keep our eyes on the prize being rewarded in heaven by Jesus Christ. Wow, this one is so powerful. You'll find it in chapter 4, verses 8. Jesus shall reward us and we shall rejoice with him forever all through eternity. We must strive to avoid both false doctrines and ungodly practices. Ungodly practices. What are some of the ungodly practices? Ungodly practices. Ungodly practices. And also avoid false doctrine. What are some of the ungodly practices? The Bible talks about malice slandering, gossip, jealous, and all manner of evil that we can mention. We know them. There are so many. Those are ungodly practices, believing in foreign and strange gods apart from the living God of Israel. Therefore, we should avoid all this. And he is saying like this can only be accomplished by being grounded in our knowledge of God. Being grounded, being grounded. You have a root, you be strong in the word. Grounded in the word of God. Grounded in the word of God. In the word of God. Grounded in the word of God. So if we are grounded in the word of God, then we will be able overcome all this manner of malice, all these things of slandering, and every evil practice. And so we want to move on again, and we see what else Paul is trying to instruct Timothy in his last words. 
Uh, well, uh, we can just uh, com- conclude this part like uh, Paul is saying here. This can only be accomplished by being grounded in our knowledge of God's word and firm in our refusal to accept anything that is unbiblical. Refuse to accept anything that is unbiblical because that's some of the ways you are able to manage a godly Christian life. And so, as we conclude the second Timothy, we want to go very fast. We want to go very fast to another book, still under Pauline episodes. We want to go very fast to another book which we call the book of Titus. The book of Titus. This is Titus. We want to look at this book, Titus, which is also one of Paul's uh, episodes. Paul's episodes, and we can see that uh, the author is Paul. Author is Paul, St. Paul the Apostle, and again he wrote it to Titus. It was directed to Titus, and the dates for this book that it was written is AD 66, AD 66. Paul's many journeys are well documented and show that he wrote to Titus from Nicopolis. He wrote it from Nicopolis in Epirus. In some Bible subscriptions to the episode may show that Paul wrote from Nicopolis in Macedonia. He wrote it from Macedonia, Nicopolis in Macedonia. However, there is no such place known as subscription have no authority as they are not authentic. Well, that is that. He wrote it that time. And we want to look at the purpose that Paul was writing this book to Titus. Purpose for writing. The purpose that Paul was writing this letter is known. Uh, this letter is known as one of the pastoral episodes. This letter is also known as the pastoral episodes, just like Timothy. And uh, the two letters of Timothy plus this one, they are pastoral episodes. The episode was written by the Apostle Paul to encourage his brother in faith. To encourage his brother Titus in faith. To encourage his brother in faith. And also, we can see that Titus, whom he had left in Crete to lead the church which Paul had established. Well, Paul had gone to Crete. Paul had gone to Crete. Crete is uh, today in in what we call Turkey. And uh, he was there. He established a church. And he left Titus to take care of that church and Paul had established one of his missionary journeys that is Titus 1 5 Titus 1 5 Titus 1 5 you see there this letter advises Titus regarding what qualifications to look for in leaders for the church for qualifications of leaders qualifications of leaders qualification of leaders in church qualification of leaders in church and we can see titles for the reputation of those living on the island of Crete also 
reputation reputation the crater is an island in Turkey and um, they were living there and so Titus was in charge of the church so he was concerned about the reputation of people who were living there in addition to instructing Titus in what to look for in a leader of the church, Paul also encouraged Titus to return to Nicopolis for a visit. In other words, Paul continued to disciple Titus and others. They grew in the grace of the Lord together. Key verses, chapter 1, verse 5, chapter 1, verse 6, whereby Paul is saying, they claim to know God, but their, their actions, they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. So it's so wrong to proclaim or to claim that you love the Lord Jesus Christ, yet your actions prove otherwise. That's what Paul was working on. And also chapter 2, verse 15, chapter 2. Verse 15, that's another key chapter there, where Paul is saying, These then are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Do not let anyone despise you for any reason. Rebuke and teach these things so that there should be order. Again, we can see in Titus chapter 30, Titus chapter 3, in verses 3 to 6, where Paul is saying, At one time we too were foolish, we were disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. If you see people hating one another, if you see people like that, they are still living in the flesh. They haven't given up their lives to Christ fully so that Christ can take control over their lives. And also whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. People who have been poured, the Spirit of God has been poured out to them people who are led by the Spirit, they don't live in hatred, they don't live in malice, they believe in the mercies and the grace of God, and there are people who are obedient to the Word of God, they are humble in the name of Jesus Christ. We want to look at the brief summary, the brief summary. want to look at the brief summary. It must have been when Titus received a letter from his mentor, Apostle Paul, that Paul was a much honored man and rightly so after establishing several after establishing uh, several churches throughout the eastern world this famous introduction from the apostle would have been read by titus to titus my true son in our common faith grace and peace from god the father and christ jesus our lord and savior that one is chapter 4 1 verse 4 1 verse 4 and uh, this island of Crete, where Titus was left by Paul to lead the church, was inhabited by natives of the island and Jews who did not know the truth of Jesus Christ. The people who were there in Crete, they were natives of that land, of course, the Gentiles, and also the Jews who had no knowledge about Jesus Christ and we can see that uh, in Paul in that Titus 1 12 that Titus 1 12 
you will be able to see that Paul felt it to be his responsibility to follow through with Titus to instruct and encourage him in developing leaders within the church at Crete as the Apostle Paul directed Titus in his search for leaders. Paul also suggested how Titus would instruct the leaders so that they could grow in their faith in Christ. He instructed Titus how he will teach and instruct those people to grow their faith in Jesus Christ. His instructions include those for both men and women of all ages. In that one you will find it in chapter 2 verse 1 to 8. Chapter 2 verse 1 to 8 instructed him and this was all to do with all ages from women, from young, from the elderly people and again to help Titus continue in his faith in Christ himself. The pastor has to be strong in faith first before he instructs his congregation and the assembly that God has placed him over. And again, we can see how Titus would instruct the leaders so that they could grow in their faith in Christ. Leaders also ought to grow in Christ. Leaders ought to grow in Christ. Leaders ought to grow in Christ. Taking in the word, taking in the teachings, taking in the instructions altogether. His instructions include those for both men and women of all ages. And we can see that uh, that word is very key. We want to look at the practical application so that we can wind up on this book of Titus practical application practical applications practical application the book of Titus deserves our attention as we look to the Bible for instruction the book of Titus deserves our attention as we look to the Bible for instruction on how to live a life pleasing to our Lord. A life pleasing unto our Lord. A life pleasing unto our Lord. We can learn what we should avoid as well as which we are to strive to imitate. Paul suggests we seek to be pure as we avoid the things which will defile our minds and conscience. We should avoid things that may defile our conscience and we should strive for our faith to keep it alive and just to please our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then Paul makes a statement which should never be forgotten. They claim to know God, but their actions deny Him. They claim to know God, but their actions deny Him. This is a practical application, application that we can apply in our own lives. We should not uh, claim to love God, claim to know God, yet we deny Him by our actions, by how we do things, by how we treat others, by how we walk our walk of faith. We should love the Lord in a honest manner and be true to the words of the Bible and the Gospel. And we can see that uh, that one is very clear. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. We should not be detestable and be unfit to do any good thing. That is Titus 1.16. As Christians, we must examine ourselves to be sure our lives line up with our profession of faith in Christ. 
whatever we do, we must make sure that we are in line with the word of God. We are in line with what we profess to be as children of God, to be uh, very keen on the work of God. And let us not profess to know him, but we deny him and his power. Along with this warning, Paul also tell us how we can avoid denying God. We should avoid denying God. And uh, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out to us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior by seeking a daily renewal of our minds by the Holy Spirit, we can develop into Christians that honor God by the way we live. We should develop our Christian walk by the way how we live on a daily basis. And this is very, very important, beloved, that we may honor the Lord by our own lives, how we live on a daily basis, so that we may not just claim to know him, but again at the same time, we are denying the power of salvation by our deeds, by our daily lives. And up to this far, we are coming to the end of this lesson today. I just want to say that may God bless you so much, may God keep you, may God strengthen you, and that we may emulate this example of Apostle Paul just to live for God and to live for this purpose and Him alone. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, we bless you. We have come to the end of our lesson. Bless us all together and keep us safe in your arms. Continue to teach us your word, your way, and your will, which is the best for us. And all the glory shall return to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you.